Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Wired for Hybrid. This is a um, busy week for us. Uh, as you can see over my shoulder here, uh, we're right in the middle of build. We are. Uh, we were hoping that maybe there'd be some tidbits that would come out about uh, Azure networking, but so far it's been mostly uh, focused on developer and AI. Uh, if you can believe it. Anyway, so this week, uh, join us for what's new in Azure networking. Hey, Michael, how you doing? I'm doing excellent, Pierre. Uh, enjoying your build week? It's a little busy. It's a little busy. Lots of sessions to watch. I'm... Uh, moderating a, a few of them and uh i got one more later this afternoon the uh mark rosinovich session where uh we're going to be answering questions in the background so i'm looking forward to that one how about you yeah same here you know the the one nice thing for the, those people that are out here listening um as you know i'm a content developer with build the week before is kind of good if you don't have something going into build because we have a freeze on all documentation since the 15th. So it gives us a little bit of time to maybe catch up on something and that sort of stuff. But as far as build is going, just some really, really cool stuff. Some stuff that, you know, I'm always like, they announce all these great things. This was even before I joined Microsoft. And it's like, when can I get to use this? Like, I want to go home now and use Microsoft 365 Copilot. I can't wait for the June Windows Copilot that Panos talked about today. That's yep. so many cool things. And I know that the show is focused on networking, but all of you in the audience, Hit that like, hit that subscribe, and put in your comments if you want to hear Pierre and I talk about co-pilots and generative AI and GPT and how you as IT pros can be really using that in your environment. Because I'd love to have that, that chat with Pierre about that. So I just put him on the spot right now for that. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> and speaking of content, I don't know if our uh, listeners uh, know, but... Uh, the last time, uh, last episode, we were live at the uh, PowerShell Summit or PowerShell and DevOps Summit in uh, Bellevue, Washington. Uh, we had a little uh, kind of like hack a doc at the end or, or a docathon. I don't know what the, the term we finally uh, landed on, uh, but we kind of fixed the documentation for like, I think it was something like 200 pages of documentation in Microsoft. So if you see something in the documentation, if it's a wrong command, if it's a typo, if it's uh, something, you can hit that little edit button at the top and suggest uh, an edit to our own documentation. That's how it gets better. So our own documentation is now open sourced. So absolutely help That'd Michael be... and uh, fix his- Help uh... us out, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, first item this week, Michael, what's up? We got generally available cross-region service endpoints for Azure storage. So just to kind of give everybody a refresher, what service endpoints are for virtual networks is it basically gives you that direct connection over the Azure backbone to a number of different services. You know, think of like data like SQL and Cosmos DB. And, you know, specifically here, we're talking about Azure storage and, and data link. So traditionally with these service endpoints. Those are, those are typically more like PaaS services, correct? Yep, yep. Okay. So um, there's a whole huge list of it. And unfortunately I rebooted my computer, so I no longer have that list. But uh, we'll, we'll put that yeah, for put you it, down. We'll put it the, down here somewhere. In the comments. So it's mostly yeah. those pad services. So instead of having to like, you know, connect through, you know, across the public internet, whatever, getting over there, it's basically a direct connection and allows you to utilize that, the, the higher speeds that you get running on the Azure 
as your backbone. So traditionally, service endpoints, you've only been able to use them in the same region or if you have paired regions with Azure storage, you could use that. So yeah. with this, what this allows you to do is you can go across any region. So you can connect to Azure blobs or data lake storage from VNets in any of your regions. So you might be thinking, Mike, what's the value of this for me? So let's say you have a global infrastructure. You're across regions all across the world. You have a centralized storage location. Maybe it's because of access control. Maybe it's a security concern, regulatory, whatever. Let's just say you need to have everything central. This allows you to be able to access those from all your VNets and not having to have a service endpoint in every one of those regions going to storage in those regions. So it, it gives you a lot more scalability and access for networks as they're getting more global, as, as people are bringing their data closer to them and closer to where their customers are. Yeah, and it also makes the um, management of those service endpoints a lot easier because you don't have, like you mentioned, you don't have to create one in every region. You can just have the one and manage that. That's perfect. Yep. And another one of the neat things that it does is that uh, with this update, it changes. So you're no longer con connecting using public IP addresses to those storage accounts. You're now using private IP addresses. That's right. Because for example, a blob storage would have like a, it, it has a very long URL, but it is yep. exposed to the internet. So you can Absolutely. basically, instead of having to, from your VM, go out to the internet, hit that DNS name, come back into Azure. Now you go directly. Yep. You go directly through those service endpoints. So, um, Let's see, some other stuff with this. We talked about the centralization of the data. Along with that, what you can also do is, you know, we're, we always talk about high availability, high availability, not enough coffee today, and business continuity. And yeah. so what you can also do is you can still do cross-region replication. So you yeah. don't have to just put all of your eggs in one basket. You can still replicate that storage and have it work with this as well. So you can, you can make it highly available, highly scalable, but also make it easier for you to get into those workloads. So we'll have some links for you. Um, I'll also throw in some links to service endpoints as well, because that's, that's an area when I talk to a lot of people, not a lot of people, they've heard about them. They might not be using them. We'll throw some articles in there for you to get a better understanding of those and maybe check them out yourselves. Perfect. Yes. And those will all be in the show notes uh, and we will list them in the description down here, uh, linked to the blog article with all of the uh, details. Unless you're in Australia, they might be up there. <laughs> <laughs> They're not watching us upside down, you know. <laughs> the, we could totally cut this. The only reason I say that is my buddy Glenn from Australia his avatar everywhere is upside down. Oh, God. <laughs> um, all so, right. Pierre, uh, what do you got for us? Yes. So, general availability, availability, as you mentioned, not enough caffeine. Uh, Azure CNI overlays are generally available. And if you're asking yourself, what the hell is an Azure CNI overlay? Uh, you're asking the right question because I had the exact same um, response when I first saw the uh, the announcement. But the more I look into them, the more I think this is a fantastic thing, uh, especially for now when we are in the age of the container in AKS where you've got pods and dozens of containers uh, running your application. So what the Azure CNI overlay is, it's a new uh, networking options for Kubernetes uh, services or Azure Kubernetes services that assigns IP addresses to pods from a private address space, which means that 
just like when you're in a in a network environment, you're on a, um, a regional office and you've got like a 192.168.1.1 address or dot one dot zero slash twenty four address for your address for your local office, and as you go up to the uh, to the internet or to your uh, other offices, you're actually getting NADed or network address translationed uh, at the uh, egress point. Now with the CNI overlay, that's basically the exact same concept that happens. So all of your pods can talk to each other using that private IP address. Those private IP address can be reused across different pods because uh, they would never talk to it, uh, not different pods, but different like environments. And they would never talk to each other because they're always added through the um, AKA service. So it's, they communicate with each other using that overlay network uh, without encapsulation or custom routes. Uh, the pods use the external endpoint uh, or NAPs through the, the node's uh, own IP address. Uh, and it's been generally available since May 10, so about uh, a week ago or a week, a week and a half ago. Nice. Yeah, that sounds like, you know, for a lot of people, you know, that are starting to to move into the containerized world and and using AKS, I, you know, I can imagine with all of the containerizations of different apps and everything that much like when you and I were running data centers is we went through the late 90s and the 2000s of data center sprawl that led to virtualization. You know, there's probably a lot of organizations that have container sprawl. And maybe I just created a new, a new, a new buzzword, container sprawl. Uh, but this is this is awesome because it does. You know, you can create pretty big address spaces yep. inside of Azure. But I could totally see if somebody just put the wrong slash, maybe made it a wee bit too small that you could probably run out of that. So having that ability to have it, those those pods natted, I think is a great feature. Yeah, and if we were looking at it in the, the with the idea of like security is everywhere and is everybody's business, uh, by having a private IP like that, it also kind of, it's not foolproof, but it does add a layer of security because those IP addresses are not exposed. So all of your pods and everything that's communicating uh, behind the, behind the um, uh, the node or inside the node is not being cannot be sniffed for example good stuff and i okay. think it, you know continuing on that security thought i believe we got something new for ddos protection yes yes uh well We've always had, or we've had for a while now, uh, IP protection uh, for uh, Azure DDoS protection for, for your environments. Now there's uh, what's generally available is a new SKU. Just like with other services that we reviewed uh, in past episodes, these are the same services that have been tuned for like very large uh, environment or, or big, big enterprises, but now they're being tuned for SMBs so small and medium businesses, uh, in which case uh, you can have the protection from uh, Azure D DDoS protection um, and defend against DDoS attack and DDoS grade protection. Uh, but now you can get it at a lower price point. Of course, uh, there are always uh, some adjustments in terms of how much you can process and, and so on. But this particular SKU is, is specifically tuned for small and medium, uh, medium businesses. Uh, you get the exact same uh, protection for like a L3, L7 uh, protection for DDoS attacks. Uh, your your additional features uh, add uh, DDoS response or rapid response support, sorry. So if something does happen, you have some recourses, uh, cost protection, and an integration with Azure Firewall Manager. So it's kind of cool. That is great stuff. You know, uh, I think, you know, continuing to build out that 
uh, set of resources and features that small to medium sized businesses can get into that give them the class of security and mm -hmm. services that the the enterprises have had for a long time. You know, this also I can also see this used in some of the larger organizations as well that maybe they don't need to have every one of their, you know, IPs covered by this. You know, there might be this option to kind of look at it singularly, but I think I think you totally hit on the head that this is really designed that that lower cost point yeah. for those SMBs that you know, they want to get this protection, but they, you know, well, everybody deserves that protection. They do. Everybody does. Everybody. And does. now, so. and now it's reflected in the price. Yep. Okay. Uh, I think we have a segment that we've never done before. We talked about it, uh, I think, or we alluded to it in the past, but this is really the first time where we're going to talk about retirements. Pierre, I didn't know you were retiring. No, I'm nowhere. In the, I'm in the pine oh, box program. Okay. Oh, They're you're talking take me about out of Microsoft in a pine box. Oh, you're talking about service retirements. Okay, service Good. retirements. Yes. Good. I thought maybe I was going to have to do this show with Rick. No, nah, no, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Uh, so yeah, so there's every once in a while, and Microsoft, we've been very clear since i think it was 19 is it 91 where we came up with the uh, the enterprise life cycle uh, support agreement or life cycle support statement where every product that was uh, at the time was uh, five years of mainstream support five years of extended support and after that they had custom support if you uh, if you were able to justify it uh, with the cloud this becomes a little bit more nuanced. Um, so now we're when we had, uh, announce a product or a service that's retiring, uh, we do it way in advance. So yeah. there is uh, a couple of them. I'll do the first one and you can cover the second one. Um, there's a retirement notice for uh, public peering. So no new express public peering connections will be allowed, uh, actually have been allowed since 2018. So that's how long we've uh, been getting. But now the, the dates uh, have actually been set for March 31st, 2024, where public peering or V1 of public peering um, is going to be out of service. So there are there is ways and documentation on how to migrate to the current version, uh, but that gives you a full year before you get there. So that's kind of cool. That is kind of cool. And as far as application gateway, so application gateway V1 is going to be retired on the 28th of April in 2026. So you should be transitioning over to application gateway uh, V2. So this means you've got until 2026. So you've got about three years, three years in yeah. order in order to get over to that transition. And also, you know, if you're a new customer and you've got you've got something planned in the works, you should be planning to put this onto V2. Because starting on July 1st of this year, there's going to be no more V1 that you can actually deploy. So maybe in the yeah. audience, you got this working, a project working in your organization on this. You want to make sure that they are specking this for application V2, unless you are on a quick path to get this done before July. Even yeah. then, I would recommend moving up to V2 because you're going to get you're going to get the newest features. You're going to get the best feature set. You're going to get a longer life on that as well. Yeah. So it's a good idea to do an inventory of the services that you're running, uh, either by looking at your, your, your bill at the end of the month to see all the services that are, but also when looking at uh, the CI CD pipelines that you may have in your environment. So if the autom if the deployment of the application gateway has been automated somehow as part of a, uh, like a workload that you're managing or deploying or monitoring or involved in any way, 
uh, take a look at your your pipelines to make sure that those are also you have time to like test them and and modify them and test them uh, to move from V1 to V2. And there's also a script, if I'm not mistaken, correct? There's a PowerShell script yep. to, to help you absolutely do the migration. There's there's a PowerShell script that's that's in our documentation that will walk you through the migration process. We'll have that, like everything, inside the show notes for you, and you'll be good to go. Yep. So that was it. Um, not as many uh, GA as we normally get, uh, but that was kind of expected in the, in the month uh, prior to build, because like Ma Michael uh, mentioned, we, there is some embargo and then there's some lockdowns. You're not allowed to announce anything and you're not allowed to make any new documentation until build is over or until the event is over. Uh, in this case, uh, that'll be uh, on the Friday, I believe. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm expecting that we will probably have a few more things, hopefully, to talk about in the June and July yep. and August shows. And then... I would expect once fall starts rolling around, we're going to be pretty busy with, with Ignite coming up yeah. in November. I know a lot of service, you know, that's, you know, you think about it builds kind of that event for, you know, a uh, lot of developer type stuff. You know, there was a little, yeah. you know, I'm big into the AI sort of stuff. So there were a lot of great sessions for me, but is generally, you know, there's generally not a lot of stuff focused on, you know the infrastructure side ignite there was a big... lot there was a lot on monitoring and managing uh, yeah. a containerized or aks environment kubernetes environment so there's a, quite a few uh, sessions in there that i thought were uh, are interesting but that yeah, being sure. said uh, and talking about more stuff is coming uh, we do have two episodes in the can two deep dives that i'm currently editing that will be released uh, in the upcoming uh, week or weeks, uh, the deep dive on WAF. No, no, the deep dive on front door and the deep yep. dive with Andrea on uh, AVNM. So Azure Virtual uh, Azure Virtual Network Virtual Manager. Network Manager. Yep. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think everybody's going to be really excited about those. Both are, you know, they're both pretty long, but I think that they're really, really solid information. Both Dong and Andrea did an amazing job of introducing yes. us to the products and also deep diving into the what, the how, and the why, and showed us some great demos of how to use uh, those products and why you should be using them in your environments. Yeah. So if you don't want to miss that, like and subscribe. And Michael and I will see you next month. So, Mike. Great to see you again and everybody else. As always, have a good week. Cheers. Take care, everybody.